I'll get Jane to introduce her panel, and I think they're going to have a really interesting discussion. Thank you very much. I'm expecting somebody to just appear behind me in just a second. So, thank you very much for coming along bright and early this morning. Um, we, are, we have some great speakers on our panel. Um, and what we want to do today is to take a forward-looking view on what scholarly communication might look like in the future. We're not going to focus specifically on publishing or publishing issues. We're not going to look backwards on what is not working. We're actually trying to look very much forwards and see what the options might be and you know, what maybe what the obstacles are and how different stakeholders are going to respond to the challenges that people see. So um, we have a researcher in uh, Germany who hopefully will appear mm -hmm. any minute now. Unfortunately, I just... Hi, Bjorn. Oh, he's there. So um, Sarah, unfortunately, from RSC can't be with us today. She's got the flu. So we are going to do a, a valiant job without her. So let me go straight into um, questions and, and discussion. So let's assume that um, perhaps something like Towards Responsible Publishing really takes off. It has a broad coalition of support in Europe for sure. So what is that going to do for the researcher and how would they like to see that go in the future? So Bjorn, do you want to start us off? Yes, I can do that. Um, from my perspective, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for piping me in and I hope my video isn't as choppy as the one that I'm seeing right now. So from my perspective, you all look like you have some weird synchronized Parkinson disease because you're all uh, nodding your heads and, and moving in really strange ways at, at the same time, very synchronized. So I hope my video comes across uh, better than that. Um, but thanks a lot for piping me in and uh, letting me participate uh, from here uh, in Regensburg, an hour north of Munich. And um, for me, this is a very strange situation right now um, because in the 15 years or so that I've been following these, um, these, these, these attempts to um, modernize research infrastructure, digital research infrastructure, um, there's usually been dissent. So some people said, oh, we need this. Other people said, no, 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 it's much more important to do this first. And libraries didn't agree with researchers. Researchers didn't agree with university leadership uh, and funders disagreed about what needed to be done. But now, uh, since about last year, there's some really um, unusual unanimity, unanimity um, in that what we should be doing is strengthening institutional infrastructure and reducing our dependence, and as, as the EU science ministers called it, uh, trying to break the vendor lock-in. And with, with uh, that term, they, of course, they meant the publisher, uh, the publishers and their stranglehold. And so the, uh, after now many, many years, the EU science ministers concluded, well, this is what we should be doing. We should be investing in local in or institutional infrastructures, uh, a federated system of institutional infrastructures, instead of relying on uh, commercial service providers that uh, sit monopolistically in a situation where they can dictate all the conditions and all the prices. And on the same day, the largest European research organizations came out with a press release saying, yes, 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 absolutely, this is what we should be doing. Uh, the German funder, the DFG, in our case, had uh, a separate press release to the same um, content. And uh, the, a bit later, uh, Coalition S, uh, the group of, of funders there, they also said, yes, this is absolutely how we should be doing it. So now it really appears that all the high-level organizations, the researchers that represent researchers, funders, uh, um, and politicians, uh, in this case, high-level ministers, science ministers, they all agree that this is what we should be doing. And the consequence of that, one consequence of that that isn't spelled out in, in most of the documents or in, in, in all of the documents, is that, of course, we would not be able to continue to 
uh, use the traditional journals because they're owned by the publishers and they uh, exert the vendor lock-in and that's the, precisely the vendor lock-in that we should be breaking. And uh, that stage, that would set the stage for a system which is uh, what uh, my colleagues and I, some colleagues and I have been advocating for many, many years now, and this will transform the way, the way I as a researcher would work. Because what that would do is that I would have local infrastructure that would take care of my digital data that I collect. I wouldn't have to worry, okay, where do I put it? Where do I, where can, where can I uh, place it in a safe way? When that, and then where, how can I make it accessible? What kind of um, technical details do I need to pay attention to? All of that would be taken care of by an infrastructure. Same goes for my code that I have to write uh, so that my digital data that are just zeros and ones actually become graphs and statistics and evaluations so that the people, people can understand uh, the results that we've collected. As an author, my life would also be so much easier. I could focus really on uh, writing the articles, writing the narrative, explaining really well what it is um, that we have found out. I could just drag and drop individual bits and pieces, either of code or of evaluations, figures. I can draw figures into, uh, drag and drop figures in, into uh, panels uh, to create multi-panel figures. And via automated link back, people would get access to the raw data and the code automatically and I wouldn't have to worry about these things breaking or about my links not being working properly because I had to copy and paste them and making mistakes. All of this would be automated and helpful and if I wanted to publish all this uh, together with my co-authors, all we would need to do is click on our publish button and it would be published rather than shopping around and discussing should we send it to this journal or that and then maybe, you know, submit it, get rejected, and then submit it again and get rejected again until eventually at some point with a lot of loss of effort and, and uh, strain on our time budgets and on social, on the social structure of co-authors that every single time again have to negotiate what to do next. So all of that would be gone. That would be fantastic. As a reviewer, it would also be a great system because what I would then have is I would, for instance, be able to comment directly on manuscripts and authors would just be able to click accept or decline on my comments. I would be able to interact with them uh, on a pseudonymous or anonymous flexible system that would allow us to uh, negotiate and discuss points of contention and rule out misunderstandings that are usually in these days still uh, only ruled out after days and days of slow back and forth. And in this case, this could be done interactively and much, much more efficiently and quickly. So from my perspective as a researcher, collecting, doing experiments and collecting data, writing code from an author or from a reviewer, if the plan put forward by the science ministers, if that would be the future, I would have would not have any reason anymore to sit on panels like these and advocating for it because then I would have the kind of thing I've been waiting for since 1994 about, which is the first time that I collected digital data and wrote code to evaluate that data. So for that, since that time, roughly, I've been waiting for the kind of infrastructure that now finally, after nearly, after almost exactly 30 years, um, there seems to be agreement on that this is what we need. So after 30 years of waiting, I'm really happy Bjorn, Bjorn, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I just want to break yes, just... Yes, now I can hear you. I'm done. Okay, I just want to break for a minute <laughs> and see if we've got any... Because I think you've, you've painted a great vision for how things will work from a research perspective. I want to make this as interactive as possible. So do we have any researchers in the audience who'd like to comment on that or give their views on how they would like to see um, this kind of research environment, this kind of communication working in the future. Any any comments from any of our researchers in the audience? Okay. If not, I think we will go. We'll go over now to Yvonne, um, who is a, a librarian from Cambridge and very um, invested in in how scholarly communication works. So. Can you give us some thoughts from your perspective, Yvonne, on how this is going to challenge institutions and how they might respond to that? Yes, can you all hear me okay? OK, 
because I've got the mic. Good. Thank you. Um, I have a dual hat. I'm a librarian, but also I run a small peer review journal, which is a, based on a preprint server on archive, which we do at very low cost. And one of the reasons we did that was some of my colleagues are very doctrinally committed to open access. Um, I think the problem we have now in academic institutions, especially, and I can only speak from the UK perspective, is that many people were invested in open access, you know, with Budapest Open Access Initiative. So it was a doctrinal thing. They wanted to make um, access to research and dissemination of research as, as equitable as possible. And, you know, 12, 13 years after the Finch report in the UK, we're now in this transformed open access environment where the default by many of our publishers, by our funders, is that material has to be made open access. And the route that is most usually taken to achieve this is gold, although that we also use green, in, you know, in both institutionally and across the UK environment. The problem we have with many of our researchers now is that open access is very much compliance. So I work primarily in the physical sciences and quite often the, when we're talking to our current researchers about open access and about the fact that they have to make things available open access because of their funding, what they turn around and say is, but we've put it on the archive, it's open access. So to some extent, we have people who are very much, very invested in open access, but they really resent having to pay and to make, to follow funder compliance. And actually in some of the subjects I work with, for example, mathematics, people aren't holding research grants. So the research that they're doing is individual research, much in the way, so they're not holding research grants, they're funded by the University for Teaching and there's a research output, but they're not holding research grants. So it's quite difficult to get some people on board with the idea that we currently have of trying to get people to pay for open access. In terms of having a more equitable, and as Bjorn was saying, taking across, almost like across European stance on open access and having funder platforms and making it easier to publish. The, the only thing our researchers are particularly concerned with is who, how do I pay for open access? Should I be paying for open access? We have quite a few researchers who don't hold research grants, who can't access payment for journals in peer reviewed journals, for, for journals because they don't hold grants and there isn't fund, they believe that funding isn't available, although usually it is. Um, and we have retired people fund, you know, retire, who are still research active in the university. So for many people, the major issues are compliance, either they don't want to comply or they don't feel they have to, and payment. So anything that can be done to make the process easier and smoother for researchers is obviously going to have enormous benefits. Um, there are various questions that I probably have that I don't know how commonplace these probably are. But for example, research is truly international. So some of, you know, at home, my partner is writing a paper with colleagues in the US. At which point does this become published? So even if we're looking at European perspective, a huge amount of research we do in the university is with people in the US, it's with people in China. And research is truly distributed and global. So that actually makes it quite difficult to, to work out where the cost should actually fit. And that's something I feel that hasn't been fully addressed. And I don't know, even if Europe, because of, unfortunately, because of Brexit, I don't know where we sit in terms of European funding going forward. You know, if, we, if we're working with researchers from countries where there aren't open access mandates, where does the cost fall? And I think that's something that as a community, we actually have to address. Personally, I think my, what, I think my preferred solution, which is perhaps a bit naive, is I really like preprint servers and the idea of doing peer review on preprint servers because I think there's a lot to be said and this reflects the people I work with. So if you go to anybody in maths, some aspects, some 
parts of physics, and of course, high energy physics have got scope three, but even then, so maths, physics, astronomy, the working practice every morning is to sit in front of a preprint server and to look at the research that comes, and people are very good at filtering what is actually beneficial research and what is just noise. And I don't know if something we could be talking about as a community is how we actually sort of capitalise on the fact that researchers are in particular places and go to the researchers as opposed to having the researchers come to us. So in terms of you know, working practice for universities, I think making things easier to access is only of beneficial because it's only of great benefit. A few years ago, nobody in the university was being paid to actually administer open access. Now we have a, a sizable team doing so. So there's still, we've got more costs in many ways than we had back when we, we were accessing print, jour, print or electronic journals online. The other thing which is, I think, relevant, at least to me, is I feel we're still being, despite all the transformative agreements, um, I think we're still very much a legacy of print publishing in terms of how we're being charged for actually publishing in journals. And I would really like to see a break from that. So anything that can help with that, I think would be really useful. And I'm keeping away from OA books because that's that's on my sphere of knowledge. So. Thanks, Yvonne. Any, any librarians in the audience want to comment on that? Should we move to preprint servers? And here we go, there's one at the back. I can't see who that is. Is it Lisa? I think it is Lisa. Yeah. Oh, Lisa. <laughs> It's good to meet Lisa in person. I know. <laughs> We've, yeah. Um, I'm Lisa Inchef, University of Illinois. I'm wondering, uh, Yvonne, I'm struck by two things that you said, so I'm wondering if you could expand on them. One, you said that um, researchers say, oh, I put it on archive, so I resent having to pay. Yeah. Does it bother them that their university is paying for archive? Because archive is not actually a free service. I know. It is free to them. So are they objecting to payment in the process or are they objecting to payment made by them? And the other thing I just want to ask, you just said at the end there about preprint servers, you know, the, 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 the daily practice is to go to the server, filter the research. I did not hear you say that the daily practice was to comment and review on the servers that offer that. So how much are they actually commenting and reviewing in that process? So in terms of archive, the last time I knew a figure for Cambridge, it was about eight years ago, we were asked, and it came to me, should we be paying for archive? And of course, I was asked by the then university librarian, I was going, yes, of course we should, it's wonderful, it's marvellous. At the time, I think it was something like $10,000. Um, I'm not sure what the figure is now, and I think it's paid nationally by GIST, can we now contribute? But at the time, I thought, that's a bargain, you know, that's a price of three nature APCs, I think the researcher's problem is they may not be aware, although I tell them that we pay for our archive, but they say, oh, but that's nothing. That's nothing compared to, you know, the cost of actually an APC for publishing. And there is an extent to which people are quite bloody minded about it. If it's, you know, they don't feel they should be paying to publish something when they quite often feel that peer review is not going to add much to what they've already published. And I think this is particularly true of researchers in terms of seniority. So quite often, some of my colleagues will publish on archive and they may or may not choose to then publish that in a peer review journal. And it will be cited on archive and they'll be quite happy with it being on archive. Quite, with more senior people, they will sometimes choose to publish because they have junior colleagues and they need that publishing um, recognition, basically. So, that's sort of the researcher perspective. Um, and, and that's what I'm told quite frequently. Um, they do comment on preprints. They don't, what I've seen and heard a lot of is when people actually see preprints, they quite often start really quite frenzied email discussions about, especially for example, Astro PH or the maths thing on archive. It will start quite frenzied discussions online. Um, between groups of people. Um, the journal I run, peer review is on the archive and you can choose to uh, you know, have it um, peer reviewed on the archive if you choose. But yeah, there's lots of discussion, but it may not take place in that space. 
We have a microphone just here. There's a question at the front. Does that answer your question, Lisa? Yeah, I can talk to you later. Uh, Benjamin Meyer, PhD student at the European Bioinformatics Institute, maybe adding a bit to the researcher's perspective from like a really early career researcher. So personally, I think 90% of the papers I'm reading these days are on preprint service. I'm only like afterwards, once they're published, like I follow them on bioarchive or, or archive. And once they're published, like I compare the published versions because I truly believe there's a massive improvement through the peer review process. I think it's great having that. But where I see the papers initially, and you know, also like where all the people in my field are now putting things on the preprint service, not only because they have to, but also because this is a place where people these days look at. And then for commenting, I think it's still an unsolved issue because these days most people still do that mostly on Twitter. All the people want to move away from Twitter. But essentially for me personally, Twitter is the only space where this is happening between groups and between universities. Like, okay, we have the internal communication in the institute and like among our research group and discuss there, but like to discuss with other people, it's either like emailing the authors or it's on Twitter. That's, really That's interesting. an interesting perspective. Um, maybe this is a good time to bring in Rahina to talk about how PLOS sees the future and is peer review going to move to Twitter? I'll start. <laughs> oh, gosh. It seemed quite loud. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so speaking, speaking from the perspective of PLOS, so PLOS are a fully open science publisher, we're not for profit. And um, how we'd like to see the scholarly communication system in the future is, is one that we're already working towards purposefully and intentionally at the moment. But I think there are there are kind of three core points to that I think and that is around no paywalls at the researcher level either to read or to publish sharing of multiple research outputs becoming the norm for um, how how researchers communicate their science and their research but importantly and there's this has already been alluded to to some extent is that the research assessment and incentive systems support and facilitate this mm. vision and this this scholarly communication future because as Yvonne says currently that scholarly communications landscape really does resemble by and large what we've seen in the print era we haven't taken advantage of the digital world to offer up the opportunities to really change how uh, researchers practice their science. Well, actually, to a certain extent, I think researchers have changed the way they um, practice their science and taken advantage of the opportunities offered by the digital world. But the, the way they communicate it remains by and large the same. And at, at the center of all of that is the article. The article as the marker of scientific achievement, uh, the version of record recognized as, you know, the marker of scientific achievement, the sole research output of value. Researchers at the moment are incentivized to prioritize positive and perceived groundbreaking or novel results rather than results that confirm research that's being done rather than negative results. And all of that contributes to the reproducibility crisis that we're seeing, particularly in biomedical fields. But also more broadly, it leads to duplication of efforts. It leads to a waste of time and resources. So, those other research outputs that we're talking about that have inherent value, the data, the code, the protocols, the methodology, all of which is part of that research story, um, how can that be captured and how can it become the norm? How can that be communicated as one part of a research life cycle rather than just tied to one anchor, i.e. the article? That overemphasis on the article at the expense of other research outputs also deprioritizes the investments that we may want to see in open infrastructure that can support digital open science as well. And that other component of the article, of course, is that we have business models that are based all around them and that predominate the industry at the moment, the APC. So how can we move away from that and move to this full open science future? You know, there are a number of building blocks, positive building blocks that are already in place. At a global level, we have 
things such as the UNESCO Open Science Recommendation and Definition, the first time we have global agreement that this is important and is, is you know, available as a framework for member states to utilise and apply in the way that can push this forward to their benefit as well. Because UNESCO calls out the fact that open science is fundamental to solving some of the global challenges that humanity society are facing. Um, to achieving the SDGs in, in a way that is fit for all of us as well. And, and all of that includes greater transparency in the processes of knowledge creation, its evaluation, its dissemination as well. Um, so I will, you know, and as well as the fact that actually, so that all, all the incentive systems need to be realigned to recognise this um, in a way. So those stakeholders that are part of those incentive systems, the funders, the institutions, the societies, but then also the technology and infrastructure developers who can help with this, need to align to enable, promote and reward the practice of open science. Thank you. Bjorn, do you want to comment on the issue of um, assessment and how researchers are going to be assessed in this new future? I mean, perhaps not for you, but maybe for more junior colleagues coming up, how, how will that evolve to replace what is based on the article now? Yes, this is, uh, this is a tricky issue because it's so heterogeneous, it's both uh, between fields, between institutions, between countries, and then of course between uh, more junior and less junior people. Uh, so the, uh, but give, given that the minority of people are in the situation where um, these incentive structures do not have much of an effect, uh, clearly one aspect that keeps us in the vendor lock-in is are precisely those rewarding structures. And um, there are two aspects to this. So for one, there are, and, and this, because this has been realized, there are several uh, initiatives, um, for instance, DORA or Quara. Uh, there are several initiatives that uh, where institutions can sign up to and self-pledge to not use uh, pernicious incentives anymore, such as counting papers or paper or, or publication menus. Um, so these ins these institutions, these initiatives are in place, they are slowly growing, and they certainly help, even though it remains to be seen uh, how effective they are in actually policing uh, the institutions that may have pledged but don't seem to care about those pledges. So this is uh, still up in the air. Um, th this is so this. One aspect is that you can argue that you need to have, in parallel, you need to have uh, a, a, a drive, you need to have institutions and organizations in place that uh, reduce the psychological obstacles um, towards open science. On the other hand, uh, you can see, and then this is not mutually exclusive, even though I say on the other hand, these are clearly complementary approaches. On the other hand, uh, if institutions do, as the, for instance, the EU science ministers have said, as the organizations, the, the research organizations agree, as the funders all agree, that is to divest from monopolistic corporations and invest in decentralized institutional infrastructures, then this is where the money is. And this is where the support is. So, um, Lisa Hinchliff, uh, asked about money for infrastructure. Well, I'm not paying for the light. I'm not paying for the camera. I'm not paying for the computer with my personal money. And in some cases also not with my institutional money. Uh, same goes for uh, um, furniture, for water and other infrastructure. It's the university that pays for it. That's and a, this is how infrastructure- Good point, Bjorn. Can I bring Yvonne in on that? Because I think it would be interesting to hear from the institutional perspective. So, yes. the institutional- right, If I could just finish, the, yes, if I could sorry, just finish the, the point, the point about incentive structures is that if this is what is paid for and the um, legacy infrastructure uh, is not paid for, then this has two effects. For one, it means that if it is not paid for, it will cease to exist. Commercial enterprises that do not get any money anymore just cease to exist. So I, nobody can ask me 
to publish in nature if nature doesn't exist anymore because nobody's paying for it. That's one aspect. The other aspect is as long as legacy infrastructure still exists, you face, as an author, you face the uh, dilemma. Do I pay personal money to something that is clearly deprecated by my institution uh, for some reason that, uh, for some psychological reason that I hope that some people, or I, I suspect that some people are still evaluating the leg legacy infrastructure uh, and waste a lot of time? Or do I use something that is free, as, as we've heard several times that this is the preference of, of many of our, our colleagues, uh, do I use something that is free, quick, and that is actually supported by the institution? So I, one could argue that in addition to DORA and Koara and these initiatives, implementation of an institutionalized infrastructure would have come, come with its own uh, very, very strong incentives to just ditch uh, the old system okay. for the reasons I just Bjorn, let's so. let's hear from Yvonne now and see what she what she thinks. And could you also comment on on how Cambridge is approaching researcher assessment? Future? So, Cambridge is a signatory to DORA, and the official university stance is that we don't use key performance indicators for our staff. But getting back to what both Bjorn and Rohina have said in relation to um, the fact that we still have a legacy system where the art, the unit of measurement is the academic article. This is really problematic because how do you measure how good, stroke insightful, relevant an academic article is? And at the moment, unfortunately, we are very much start with a system where we look at the journal itself and we have impact factor, which of course Dora says you shouldn't be judging a piece of research on where it's published. But if you ask any researcher I know, you know, if they have an article that will be published in Nature or even any journal, and I'm sure the people from Springer Nature are here, but it's such a strong brand, they will want to be published in that, thinking that being published in a particular journal means that this proves their research is really, really good, and that's problematic. So we have that issue in terms of impact factor. We know that some researchers, especially not necessarily in the UK, but with the journal I run, um, they won't publish in the particular journal, even though it's got it's a, a very obscure area of mathematics. But even though two or three of the editors are fields medalists, so in terms of you know quality of the journal, it's indisputable, but they won't publish in it because their universities will only let them publish in a journal that has an impact factor. And of course, the problem we have is impact factors, you get them from primarily from Web of Science, which we pay quite a significant amount of money to, and you get something similar from Scopus, but the one they're interested in is, you know, the one from um, Thomson, well, it was Thomson Reuters, it's now Paravit, you know, the Institute of Scientific ISI, ISI. Yeah. I'm trying to remember what the, what the I stands for, but it's, it's really problematic. So we have these external bodies that have systems which started off as resource discovery systems. So they were like the idea between citation indices as a librarian, I love them because they allow me to look at related research, etc. But all of a sudden these have morphed gradually into researcher assessment tools. And I think mm. that's really, really problematic. And it comes back to this idea that we're still stuck with the unit of measurement being what worked in the print era. And a point that Rohina made, which is really good, is that one of the problems we have with research now, and I, slightly at a tangent, is there are incentives for journals to publish unique research or to publish what's seen as groundbreaking research. But actually, to, for the scientific method to work properly, you need replication studies. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have those papers which are just saying, actually, this thing is correct, and we, you know, we are adding to the evidence that something's correct. Mm -hmm. That paper won't be so highly cited. That doesn't mean it's not such good research, and it doesn't mean the researchers aren't doing a very good job. Conversely, we have things I think everybody knows, like, and this is a particularly appropriate place to talk about it, the MMR debate, which has come back now because lots of children haven't been immunised as a consequence of the MMR papers. The MMR paper from Andrew Wakefield was very, very highly cited. Now, the reason it was cited 
it doesn't mean it was good research. It means lots of people were saying, no, this is incorrect. So the system we have at the moment doesn't work for science because we're still using tools to evaluate research that are very much stuck in the print era. And this stops open science and it stops, it stops the incentives to open science. So whereas I can say quite honestly, we do not sign Dora, we're very cautious about it. I have heard from researchers in the university, okay, well, that may be the university position, but my group's different. And please don't quote me outside this room, but it's, you know, I've, I've, I've heard that. And I've heard researchers, you know, we have a culture, we have a research culture, which is at odds with the university. And that's one group, and it wasn't in the physical sciences, I'm pleased to report, but it's very difficult because we still have this legacy system. And this is a big problem, I think, in trying to move. Interesting point to bring in the audience. Any, anybody met Sorry, the same obstacles? Today. Anybody got any ideas how we get beyond this? Oh, you've got one at the back on the left. Hi, Catherine Spiller from Applied Microbiology International. Um, we had an author withdraw a paper in the last month because they discovered our journal wasn't in the first quartile for impact factor. Uh, wow. And it did make me think when I had conversations with funders when I was working at JISC, they were very keen that alongside the, the mandate for open access would be the mandate for institutions to sign DORA and, and change their behaviour. And it just feels to me as if maybe the funders are in a position to put pressure on with this. And it doesn't feel like they are. I don't know if anyone else has, has come across it, but it, it shocked me that with the pressure with Dora, with all these people signing up, we're still having people withdraw a paper because of that, because they are not allowed to publish in a journal that's not in the top quartile. Yeah. And how do you judge the top quartile? I mean, it's yeah. who's doing the judging? Well, actually, it's ISI. Yeah, I agree. Any, anybody else from institutional? Oh, there's one. It's Gwen at the front. Gwen Evans Elsevier. And so I'm channeling the AI workshop a li little bit here. But what I've noticed is when you talk about incentives and a structure, it seems like the f they're incentivized as individuals to be prominent, to be respected. And in an AI world where some of that output, the code, the data, the, you know, the, the methodology can be disaggregated and sort of subsumed in an AI application and then does it necessarily benefit open science and societal impact to continue to valorize the individual instead of say all Cambridge research just comes out under the brand of Cambridge? Would it would it get away from some of those perverse incentives that an individual researcher experiences? That's really interesting. I think Bjorn probably has views on this as well. But talking from a Cambridge perspective, it's very difficult because much of our research is in large collaborations. So although in maths it's not, it tends to be the individual mathematician or two or three people. Lots of, a, a great deal of research coming out of physics, chemistry, etc. It tends to be in research groups and not necessarily research groups in Cambridge, but international research groups. So international collaboration is really, really important. So at that point you think, so you, you get, and I, I think scope three is a very good example of this. You know, you get research papers from CERN where you have hundreds of authors. There are other, like the Gaia project at the moment where one of the PIs is in Cambridge. There are hundreds and hundreds of authors on that. So, they're, but they're still being judged on the output of the paper, which is quite ridiculous, even though it's an international collaboration with hundreds of authors. So for something like that, that model wouldn't work just because some of the researchers are in Cambridge, but the rest are spread across, you know, the rest of the world, basically. I guess my, my answer would be, but if you moved the 
attribution of the research to the institution. I mean, you're a hundred yeah. authors, you're still naming each individual author and they're each individually being incentivized in a particular way. So I'm imagining a future where it's Cambridge, Harvard, you know, that it's the brand of the institution that is providing the infrastructure for the research, but I can see that being very unattractive I, I think to on, researchers. <laughs> I think on an individual level, it's probably quite unattractive because it's individuals who put in the grant applications. So I think, I think I, yours have human nature. I think yeah. Rohini wants to come in on this. Well, I, th I think you're right to call out individual incentives, but of course there are also institutional incentives and ranking systems that are prevalent and predominant, yeah. and we can't, we can't ignore that. I mean, you're calling out the brand of Harvard and Cambridge, and the, where do those brands come from? You know, rankings and profiles, and it, so it, it's, it's all the same system. There, there needs to be recognition at the institutional level of why open is important. Uh, for the wider knowledge commons, not just the institution, at the individual, you know, to provide credit for individuals so that they will do those things. And then, you know, uh, funders as well, the, all those same points for funders, that there needs to be credit for researchers who choose to share their research more openly, they're incentivized to do so. So it, it involves all those stakeholders aligning, basically, in the right way. Any other thoughts from the audience? We have one down here. Anthony? Oh, I've got one over there. Anthony Watkinson. I'm going to talk about my research now, very, very briefly. Um, working on early career researchers, we asked them a number of questions about trust. And they trust things that are peer reviewed. You say, oh, but peer review is suspect to some extent. And you would agree, because they've already said that. Uh, and then you go on to talk about trust in blogs, for example, or preprints. They put preprints and blogs in the same informal category. And then you press them and you, they say, well, actually, we trust the, the journal, the peer review journal first, and then we trust if we know the group that is, 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 has done the research, and we know, we know them, so we trust them because we know their work. Okay. Thank you. We have a question down here at the back. Just. Hello, Jennifer Smith, St George's University of London. So just in terms of the sort of measurement aspect, um, I think the whole research culture discussion is quite an interesting one. And I think there was a question how can institutions or organizations help in terms of DORA? So perhaps it is a long conversation between different parties and it has only recently started, but maybe there could be acknowledgement or looking for how you measure how much people help other people, um, how much they contribute to development of people in their teams and allowing people to develop, because um, that's quite an important point as well, I think. Oh, we've got one at the back. It's Robert. Um, thank you. It's uh, Robert Harrington from the American Mathematical Society. And um, so I agree with everything Yvonne was saying in terms of of math culture. So what occurs to me is, or a question perhaps is, you know, when you look at the different cultural contexts of fields, I think that's where credit and um, trust comes by looking at that level of, of diversity. Um, you can't just look at, um, at this as something across, say, an institution. So for example, in math, um, the intellectual property of an article is the way it's written, it's the proof itself. It's not a report on an experiment, for example. The same is very true for the humanities, and we probably shouldn't forget the humanities in this discussion. How does, how does credit and, and uh, research progress get measured in the humanities when, it, again, it's, it's about the way you express yourself, the voice you have, the ideas you express. So that's 
my question to you is, how do you reflect cultural diversity in this discussion? That's a good one for Yvonne. <laughs> yes. It's very, very difficult, <laughs> and I wish I knew. I mean, from an institutional point of view, I think group, different subjects have their own prevalent culture. And it's very easy to, you know, so high energy physics is very different from maths, it's very different from biological sciences. Um, but I don't know how you reflect that in the wider publishing landscape. And I think that is more of a question for everyone else here. Um, in terms of institutionally, when you're looking, so if I speak to any of my colleagues and they're talking about hiring people, which is when metrics quite often come into it, um, it looks to be in terms of promotion or in terms, terms of hiring. Um, they tend to, what the mathematicians say is we go and look at the papers somebody's written. And I think that's probably true or the collabor and in physics it tends to be the papers they've contributed to and the collaborations that they're with. And I think that's probably true in the humanities as well. The biological sciences obviously is completely outside of my sphere of knowledge and I think it's much. Rohina, do you see the future diverging for the different sort of disciplines that you work in? I think the future has to be mindful that there can't be a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. I think it's completely co correct to call out the disciplinary differences in how, in, and how that impacts how researchers want to communicate their research and it's taking account of that and it's, it's working with communities to understand that and not just imposing that one-size-fits-all. Mm -hmm. So in creating that system, we have to take those differences into account. We have to also acknowledge geographical differences, cultural differences, you know, the, the political, the social, the economic aspects that influence how researchers can conduct their research, how they're funded. All of those aspects come together and come to play, therefore, in terms of how those local scholarly communication research ecosystems need to function. And all of those things will only happen in conversation and in working and co-developing solutions with those mm. communities. And I, I did want to call out one other aspect of that open, you know, that future open research ecosystem and culture, everything fully open. That, that doesn't mean that there's no need for quality control. And by that, I'm not, I'm not just talking about peer review, mm. actually. Peer review is, is one aspect of that, but it is, partially subjective by nature, of course, and publishers have a role in making that peer review process as um, fair, as um, inclusive, as unbiased as it can be, or continue to try to do that. But in, in addition to that, there is a role in um, ensuring the credibility and the validity of that information, the trustworthiness of that information, the trust signals of that information, you know, as Anthony referred, you know, mm -hmm. what, what is signaling that this information is trustworthy? And actually those, those quality, sorry, I'm losing my voice a bit, those quality control aspects of, you know, identifying um, and excluding findings that might be misleading or might be misrepresented that are incorrect. That those are all part and parcel of the publication process and that we shouldn't forget about. So the future might not be journal shaped, but let's not also just get rid of all the things that are those important signals of trust in the research that's out Thanks. there. Right, so we've just got five minutes left and I know that it's, we're very, very strict on time here. So I'm gonna give each of my panelists a minute. So Bjorn, do you want to just wrap up in a minute and think about what's, what's the yes. biggest change you see in the future? I can, I can very quickly, uh, because this has come up and this seems to be at the, uh, at the interest of, of the audience, because this has come up several times. So two short remarks, one on research culture and one on quality control. And so in terms of research culture, the one thing that probably the one aspect of research culture that probably most people in this room have forgotten because that was essentially put to rest before I started in the early 90s. And that is that it used to be prominent research culture everywhere that usually older males, older male professors would dictate their articles or books, manuscripts um, to younger female secretaries. And, uh, I'm sure if you asked, had asked people before the advent of 
uh, personal computers and uh, word processing software. Uh, if that would ever change, probably nobody would have been able to imagine this would ever change. Like no professor would ever uh, go to the depth of actually typing on a keyboard. This would absolutely always be the work of uh, a secretary, clearly. Uh, and we all know how that research culture changed and how quickly that went and uh, what the factors were um, in changing that research culture. Uh, so that would be my, um, my comment on changing research culture. And in terms of quality control, I think if one looks at the data, and I'm, I'm speaking here of uh, clearly the experimental sciences, and as, as has been noted in, in other science, other fields of science, uh, different uh, aspects play a, a bigger role. But in terms of experimental sciences, the, the bar for improving quality assessment is, has actually become, if it ever was higher, it's hard to tell, but the evidence suggests that the bar on improving uh, quality assurance is actually quite low. It's not trivial, I would not trivialize the problem, but given what we know about uh, unreliable research being published today, the bar of improving on this is actually not as high as one might want to think. And so the traditional peer review as it has been implemented or had been implemented since the 1970s or so, uh, I think has, has had its time and it's really time now to improve on that and a, an institutional infrastructure would support these kinds of reforms that would actually improve on the uh, quality assessment. That would be my thanks, wrap up. Thanks Bjorn. So one minute, Yvonne. Okay, what so part of me is optimistic um, that we're moving to more open science, more open research culture. You know, we have initiatives like Dora, we have initiatives like Credit where people who, for example, may provide computer programming behind a massive experiment that they can actually go right credit for the work that they do. So I think in some respects, there are causes to be optimistic. I think institutionally, we still have barriers. We have barriers in relation to research assessment, um, not necessarily how our institution is judging it, but you know that you're, researchers are not going to say, I want to spend my life at XYZ University. And if they're going to move, this is another, there are external pressures on people to look at researchers, to tick the boxes of research assessment using metrics. And I think that's problematic. And I think that does count in the way of open science because it's very much an individualistic mechanism. So it is sort of, so I pick up on Gwen's point that there is this problem there. Um, and the other thing I sometimes feel as working in research support in a university, that our researchers are doing a huge amount of research and it would be great to have it openly available in as seamless as manner as possible. Sometimes I feel it's almost like a sausage factory that there's research to be published, research to be published, and lots of researchers feel under huge pressure to publish, huge pressure to publish in particular journals. And I think that's actually really quite unhealthy and it comes back to this idea of research culture. Mm. So anything that can be done to ameliorate that particular stress, I think. And if you look at the number of papers that have been written, I, th I think, one of the things that somebody said to me recently, well, it's well known actually, Fred Sanger, who's a double Nobel laureate, Fred Sanger would quite possibly have been sacked or have his contract terminated because for years, between the genome, he won two Nobel Prizes, one in, for the genome and one in chemistry. I, I can't remember, I'm, I'm not sure which one came first, but in between there was a barren period when he did no published research. And that sort of proves how we have problems in the system. Thirty seconds. Sorry. Yes, uh, no, no. <laughs> as Yvonne said, I think I've covered most of my points anyway. But there's uh, there's a lot to be optimistic about. And as I was referencing earlier, some of those building starting building blocks of that open future are in place. Um, you know, at PLOS, we very much see our role as challenging the status quo and intentionally pushing towards that. And we're going to continue to do that, working with uh, other stakeholders as we need to, institutions, uh, funders as appropriate. Uh, but really, yeah, let's push towards that, that aim of enabling, facilitating, facilitating and incentivizing researchers to tell that whole life that whole research story and, and think of that as a cycle rather than just a, a straight line which ends in, yeah. in one research output. Right, I, we really are out of time now because I know, um, I think, is there another talk now, Mark, or is it, it's not workshops next, is it?
I can't see what's, what happens next. Workshop next? Okay. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank my panel. I think they've shown us very clearly how this communication between the different stakeholders is going to be so important in the future. So please join me in thanking them very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.